to God Cause He has done the work for us Let's declare Man of sorrows, what a name For the Son of God who came Who with sinners to reclaim This is what He accomplished for us He bore our shame Bearing shame and scoffing rude In my place condemned He stood Sealed my pardon with His blood Yes! Let's sing it out, church! We sing church that he came for us. Let's declare. Guilty, violent, helpless, we, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. ourselves of that again when he comes when he comes our glorious king all his ransom home to bring then a new this song will sing yeah let's sing a church hallelujah we sing hallelujah what Church, 
our hope in Jesus. Those stars fall from the sky. The mighty rain descends. They come and blind my eyes. I know. love your love will not let me go and you I rest my soul and you I rest my soul yes let's sing it out loud church your love your love will not let me go and you I rest my soul and you I rest my soul ourselves of that no matter what we face we can lean in his love let's sing it your love your love will not let me go declare that church and you I rest my soul and you I rest my soul we believe it we have faith in Jesus Christ your love your love will not let me go and you I rest my soul and you I rest my soul Sing that and build faith in your heart in Jesus, your love. Your love will not let me go. And you I rest my soul. And you I rest my soul. One last time we sing of his love for us. Your love will not let me go. And you I rest my soul. And you I rest my soul. in 1 Corinthians, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. for us, one for 
Good morning. Good morning, 1045. There's a really, what up, hey. I love when I hear somebody's talking a high voice. Hey, it just means like party's on. It's good times. Now, hey, I, you know, just first things first, guys. You know, I, you know I've been worshiping, you know, as, for a while as, as well. And I just, there's a really good spirit in this church, guys. And I just, I think it needs just to 
just be talked about. A lot of times in church, people kind of like, you know, they come, they sing, they kind of just wait for God to kind of show up like this big magical cloud. And it's good, we should wait on God. But something happens when people just purposely seek God. When you seek God and you sing, sing loud and you call on his name, he will show up. I just want to encourage you guys to continue with that. There's a great, great attitude of worship in this place. And I was just really blessed back there. So anyway, thank you for blessing me. So anyway, my name is Ike. I'm the pastor of Community. And I very much uh, love meeting people. I love connecting with people. That's uh, why I left the IT world where I got to basically fix computers and watch movies all day. It was wonderful. Uh, but, you know, I, I came into this ministry because I just, I love connecting people. And uh, basically one of the things, actually I lost my connection card. I'll get one in a second. But one of the things that we are passionate about here is that we exist to glorify God. That's by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ that is rooted in the gospel. Let me just uh, grab this. Hey, man. Thanks, brother. Let's give our man a hand here. He saw a need. He met it. I was needy. Thanks, brother. So this is our connection card. It basically does that. It connects you. Uh, so if you look on here, please write legibly. Otherwise, I might not be able to connect with you because uh, I won't be able to read you. Um, you see here, first time guest. Second time guest is what it's all about there. I'm sure you know where to go from there. If you're putting a second time guest, most likely you came here and you kind of liked the feeling of um, I encourage you, you want to write in the words Foothill 101. Foothill 101 is our one-stop shop to kind of understand how to get connected in Foothill, what our beliefs are, our values, our doctrine. Also understand who all the staff are and what we do here during the week, things like that. And a lot of times you can attend a church and kind of put your foot in the water a bit and kind of feel it out. And you kind of, you know, I've, I've been there. I've moved around. I've, I've changed churches before. And a lot of times you kind of compare things. Oh, I used to like it this way. And I just don't really feel like I have this good connection. You know, the best thing you can do is just make yourself happier. It's just to kind of dive in and just say, hey, I'm just going to go to this Foothill 101 class, connect with people, find out how I can do that, and then make an intelligent decision from there once you have the intelligent information. So right in Foothill 101, it happens during service time. So there's child care. It's really easy. Uh, it happens on Saturday at 5 p.m., Sundays 9 and 10 to 45. It'll be happening next uh, January 30 and 31 at the end of this month. So uh, if you look on the back, you'll see prayer. Um, we really believe in the power of prayer here, and I'm very proud to say that every Thursday as a staff, we get together, we pray over these needs individually. We'll, we'll actually sit in small group circles and pray for each other uh, individually. And then we'll read these cards and we'll pray out loud for you because we really believe it's important, number one, and we believe in prayer. So please write down your needs. And for me as a community pastor, this is actually often how I find out about some of the needs in the church. You know, some, like somebody said they had surgery for their child. And so I was able to connect with their connect group, uh, sorry, sorry, their growth group, uh, and kind of work out some real family, godly community that way. So please uh, just put your request there. We'd love to pray with you. Awesome. And lastly, uh, what we'd like to do is hold on to this connection card, if this is your first, second, or third time, and take it out at the end of the service to the black info tent where we have awesome volunteers who once sat in a chair like you and got involved. We'd love just to give you a welcome gift. You know, if you came in my house, I might just offer you some nice orange juice or some chips to kind of add some hospitality. Uh, we'd like to give you a free gift, just that same feeling of hospitality just for welcoming you here. Amen? Awesome. I'd like to invite the ushers just to come forward and prepare as we, we worship by singing our voices and singing some great attributes to God, but now we're going to worship in a very tangible way with our financial offerings. And we have a few ways that we can facilitate that. Uh, number one, we have the good old-fashioned envelope, which you can put a check in there. Number one. Number two, you can give online and kind of a reoccurring. If you want to kind of get it out of your mind, just be like, you know, I'm done, and that way my, my faith decision was made and it just kind of happens without my weird temptations. Number two, uh, third way is text to give. This is the way my wife and I do it. You just type in the amount you want to give to four five triple seven. Takes like thirty seconds, and you can see the hundred. You put like the uh, the dollar amount. Uh, you know, what, one million five dollars, whatever works out for you. Um, <laughs> fall by foothill, uh, and and you can give very easily that way. Now, whenever we give, I think it's important to kind of talk about um, you know what we're giving for and why not. I think the best way is just to highlight something that's happening right now. So we have a group of amazing. Uh, volunteer leaders and some uh, staff leaders in our church somewhere not in America, not in the North American continent. Can somebody call out where they are? Thailand. Thailand. That is correct. Well done, Mr. Fuentes. So they're at Brianna's House of Joy. Now, this is an orphanage uh, for young girls. And if anything knows about the very sad state sometimes, and there's great tourism in Thailand. There's also a dark side of tourism in Thailand. Having a place where we can have hope for girls as they grow up at a young, very uh, you know, impressionable age, is a very, very worthwhile 
um, uh, endeavor. And so when we had our team go for the first few days, they went and hung out with these, these girls, ministered them, had a good time. We'll go to the next photo. And they actually, with the simple thing, they had a big New Year's party with these girls. Had a great time celebrating the New Year's. Everything felt really special. And now they're going to start some real practical ministry where they're going to go into, they're actually uh, in a village uh, near Pi. And you can flow through the, the pictures. Uh, they're building swing sets in small rural villages. And these are little villages that actually don't have things like swing sets. I know with my kids, I drive around, uh, like, oh, this one has a cool, you know, high slide. That slide's not very high. Let's not stop their kids. No, like, they just need a swing set, right? So we're building swing sets. And, they're, and through that, they get a chance to pray for people. I got a text from Kelly Shakirin this morning. They actually uh, got to pray with several families. And if any of you knew anything or had connections with, you know, uh, underdeveloped uh, countries, some of these cultures still have things like witch doctors, which are actually, it's not really a jokey, cute thing, magic eight ball thing. It's actually a pretty dark thing. And they actually had a chance to pray and share the gospel with a witch doctor, which is amazing. That's amazing. God is doing very, very practical things through this church and by your giving. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for your giving. And if you're not giving, I encourage you to, you know, pray Peter's prayers, a very quick one sentence, Lord, help my unbelief. Because God asks us to give because of great things that we can do for him and grow his kingdom in a very practical way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. It is such an honor to give our hard-earned income to bless your kingdom, God, and to, and to reach people who can reach other people and just multiply the goodness and the grace that you've given and shown us, Father. Lord, I just pray you give us wisdom beyond our experience just to do even further things like this, Father. And Lord, I pray for the team right now in Thailand, Lord. This is a very, very real ministry they're doing right now. I pray that you give them favor. And for some of the villages they're going to go to in the next couple of days, God, I pray that you prepare the hearts there, God, so that when they show up, you've already worked in the hearts, God, and it feels like they're just coming home. They sense your spirit, and they feel the peace, and they feel the joy, and the fulfillment that comes from serving you, God. We love you so much. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good. Um, welcome to Foothill. We're glad you guys are here with us. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and, and uh, Happy New Year. Um, so you guys are one for one, 100% attendance in 2016, so <laughs> good job. Not bad. I'm impressed. And uh, just by show of hands real quick, how many of you guys made it to 12 o'clock, stayed up till midnight? Just go ahead and raise them high. Oh, man, you guys are, because you guys get more sleep because you're at the 1045 service. I get it. Okay. Well, <laughs> me and my family were out by like nine, so we were, we were boring people. Um, but hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn uh, in, in, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And we're actually going to be starting kind of, a, it's almost like a, a two-week kind of a little mini-series within our series. Um, we're in a series, Keep Christianity Weird, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. But the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at specifically uh, two pretty well-known verses. And um, I have the opportunity to be, uh, to be, to be with you during those, those, uh, those two verses. So... Um, we're going to be answering two pretty big questions, and, and I, I really believe that these verses kind of start to shed light on, on these questions that I think a lot of us actually spend a lot of our time really chasing after, chasing after the answer. So here's kind of two questions we're looking at the next two weeks. Number one, who am I? Who am I? And secondly, why am I here? Why am I here? And that first question, who am I, we're going to talk about this week. And then that second question, why am I here, we'll get to next week. But like I mentioned, I think Matthew 5, 13 through 16, kind of get to the heart of that a little bit. So this week, let's tackle this first one and try to, in, in the process, we'll catch up with our series a little bit. So I, I think for many of us who follow Jesus, and many of us who call ourselves Christians, this is, a, it's kind of a tricky question, who am I? Because in, in one way, we have this identity piece down. Like, we really should know who we are in Jesus, in Christ, but at the same time, it's kind of difficult to articulate that sometimes. It's, it's difficult to kind of figure out how, how that works in our everyday life, and it's especially difficult for those of you who maybe aren't Christians. If, if, there's, if there's people who are far from Jesus, 
uh, because there's so many options, really. I mean, we can be anything we want to be. We can do anything we want to do because it's really all about me and making myself happy before you meet Jesus. Like, we can throw our life into hedonism. We can chase after the pleasures of this world. We can, we can chase after being wealthy. We can chase after being good and being moral. It's really up to us before we meet Christ. But then we meet Jesus, and then a lot of things change. And so maybe it was a prayer when you were five years old and you were sitting at the bedside, at your bedside and on your knees and, and your parents were there. Or maybe it was later on in life when you had a little bit more rebellion under your belt. But either way, it's still kind of difficult for us because we know our lives are about honoring God, but we still struggle with that identity piece. Like, who am I? Who am I supposed to be in this world? What are the characteristics that I ought to be known for? And so here's what many of us do. We realize we can't be everything because no one can take on like every Christian characteristic. That's just too much. That's just too much. It's too overwhelming. No one's that spiritual. And so we just, we pick one or two things to get super spiritual about. At least this is kind of what I've seen a little bit. So I'm going to hang my hat on authentic community. That's going to be my thing. I'm going to have people over and we're going to eat a lot of chips and guacamole and just kind of hang out and do life together. And this is, this is my spiritual thing. This is my spiritual identity. It's about authentic community. Or maybe you say, hey, you know what? I, I really love worship and I, I'm going to find a church that's all about music and we're going to have two hour long worship sets and people are going to cry all the time. It's going to be awesome. And this is my spiritual identity. It's going to be about worship. Or maybe some of you uh, and I, I would be honest, probably some of us here at Foothill maybe lean this last one. It's like, hey, it's about me and my Bible, right? Like, I don't need you, and I don't need you, and I especially don't need you, but I, I just need Scripture. I just need God's Word, and if I have my Bible, then I'm good. I'm set. And so the problem with picking just one thing and trying to do it on our own is we lose our alignment. We lose our, our way a little bit. Uh, imagine it like this. Just imagine for a second that, uh, that you're at the gym, and for some of us, this takes a lot of imagination, right? Myself included. <laughs> but Im- imagine you're at the gym, and for whatever reason, you decide that, hey, I'm going to work out, but I'm only going to work out one side of my body, like my right side of my body. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, like, I could talk about how we could work, just work, up, work out our upper body, but us guys do that anyway, right? That's all, all we work out anyway. But, but let's say I'm working out just the right side of my body, and so I, I do curls, and I do triceps, and I do, I do biceps, and back, and abs, and, and legs, and all that stuff, and I just get really just like ripped and jacked on my right side of my body. And, uh, and you, you may kind of think like, oh, that's interesting, that's kind of cool, because you'd be really powerful on your right side, but at what cost, right? Like, let's, you're really powerful, but you kind of look weird, right? Uh, after a while, you're, you're, you're muscles would grow and your tendons would stretch and your ligaments would stretch and after a while your, your muscles would get bigger but at the same time your, one of your hips would kind of get further back and the other one would go forward and your, your shoulders would probably get all messed up and eventually you'd, you'd throw your back out and eventually you'd, 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 you'd kind of blow out your knee because your body isn't meant to just be strong in one place. It's meant to be balanced out. It's meant to be in, in balance. And this is what happens when Christians say, hey, let's be good at one thing. I'm going to hang my hat on this one thing, read my Bible, social justice, authentic community, you know, wh- whatever that identity thing is. But in the end, you're never going to be able to answer that question, who am I? Because you're going to have a really kind of unbalanced view of the Christian life. <clears throat> in the pursuit of calling, we try and find out our spiritual niche, but oftentimes we neglect other really worthwhile spiritual endeavors. So here's what we've been studying here at Fiddle Church in Matthew chapter 5. The Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus gathers his disciples, he gathers a small crowd, and he starts talking about what does a Christian look like? That's kind of the big idea in the series. What does a Christian look like? And so if you're new here at Foothill, this is a great series to jump in with us because we get a glimpse of what Jesus says a Christian should look and and sound like. So he sits the disciples down and he talks about how Christians should should exercise the entire body. This is a comprehensive explanation, the Sermon on the Mount of this is what a Christian looks like. This is who you are. So back to that first question, who am I? Who are you? We are poor in spirit. We're mournful of our sins, we're meek, we're merciful, we're pure in heart, we're peacemakers, 
And as we heard the last few weeks, we're persecuted for the name of Christ. It's not just one thing. It's not just two things. It's the entire package. That's what God is calling us in our Christian life, to be all of these things. And uh, you may be like, well, geez, Stephen, that sounds like a little bit much, right? I mean, I know it's the new year and we're all goal-oriented, but that's, that's quite a list. It's a daunting list. Yeah, it is. And that's kind of the point, because we need God's help with this. Let me say that again. We need God's help with this, with this passage, with our life, and it is only by our submission to the Holy Spirit that we can even begin to resemble the things on this list. So at the beginning of the new year, kind of looking at, again, another characteristic of a Christian, I think, I think it is kind of the, the heart's leaning of a Christian. It's kind of the default to lean toward legalism a little bit. And as we read this, there may be a tendency for us to want to think, okay, this is just another thing I have to get really good at. And so I just want to stop right now, and I want us to bow our heads and pray and ask God to protect our heart against that leaning. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. God, God, we thank you for this clear message that we read in Matthew 5. And God, I, I pray that as we read yet another list of things that Christians are supposed to look like, and we get another sense of, wow, this is kind of overwhelming. This is a lot. Lord, I pray that you would you would protect us against this, this thought in our brains that, man, well, I have to do this on my own. God, you've never asked us to do any of this on our own. It's only by your Holy Spirit, it's only by, by, by your help can we accomplish any of this. And so, Lord, right now, right here at the beginning of this, we ask for your help. We ask for your help not only just as we pick apart this sermon, but also just in, in our lives, in our families, in our relationships, God, we can't do any of this without your help. And so we submit to you, and we ask for you to come into our lives and to do the work. We pray this in your name. Amen. So Matthew 5, verse 13. Who are we? We saw that in the Beatitudes. And specifically in verse 13, we're going to get another answer, another identifying characteristic. And Jesus calls us the salt of the earth the salt of the earth. So let's jump in. Matthew 5, looking at verse 13 today. It says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So when this passage has been preached historically, and I think it's been preached correctly, all right? Let's hear me out there. I, I think people have gotten this right, but usually what happens is people will talk about salt and they'll talk about the identifying characteristics of salt, what salt does, and then they'll go over here and say, okay, this is what we should do as Christians. So they'll say something like, hey, look, salt is a preservative. So, so we then, as a church, preserve against moral decay in our society. Salt brings flavor. So we, as a church, flavor society. I don't know what that really means, but it flavors society. Salt is a fertilizer. So we, as a church, create ground where spiritual growth can happen. And, and did you know that when people consume salt, when they drink and eat salt, it makes people thirsty. And so when people are around us as Christians, they should hunger and thirst for the things of God. All good things, all right? Good things. And I think they're right. I think they've done their homework, and I think it's helpful. But preparing for this was difficult because as I, as I read Matthew 5.13, my heart's leaning was a little bit like, okay, what direction do we want to go with this? Is, you know, is there some kind of an analogy I can use? I mean, there's so many salt analogies, and, and there's so many things I can kind of go. And, and I, while well, I could have put a salt packet on each of your seats, and I could have had somebody come up here and lick something salty or something like that, I, I just felt like, I feel like God was just telling me, like, Stephen, just, just take a step back for a second and read this again. So if it's okay with you, we're going to go a, a different direction a little bit than what you normally hear from Matthew 5.13, because, look, I don't think we need another sermon to give you more information. Like, I, I think we know a lot already. And I don't say that in an arrogant way. I just think we, information is all around us. And a lot of us just grab it up. Like, it's, it's you know, it's going out of style. But I think sometimes we just need a kick in the pants. 
I think sometimes we need a reminder and encouragement to be obedient to what God has already called us to do. I mean, for a lot of us, those of you guys who are married, it's a little bit like marriage, right? Like, anytime you're in a fight or an argument, or even if it's with a friend, like, 99% of the time, we generally know what we're supposed to do to hold up our end, right? Like, we, we know. We're like experts at our own marriages. And, and so, so the last thing our spouse and our friend or whatever wants to see is, is we're in the middle of kind of this, this argument, this discussion, and it's like, like, hold on one second. And you walk over to your bookcase, and you pull out a book that you got at premier class, and you start thumbing through finding out what the experts have to say. Like, that's not, you already know. That's not our problem. The problem isn't that we know. The problem is implementation. The problem is, is that we're not putting it into action. And so I want to talk about the core issue of what this analogy of salt is getting at. Like, why did Jesus even bring this up to begin with? Why, is, why are Christians supposed to be distinctively different? Why are Christians supposed to be influential? And we'll maybe get to salt as a preservative or a flavor a little bit, but I, I want to talk about the core idea. And So here's what I think is kind of the, the, the main gist of what we're looking at. Salt, or maybe the better phrasing, being salty, okay, is the connection for the Christian between the head, the heart, and the hands. That's what, that's what salt, that's what being salt is about, is that connection of what we know, who we are, and what we're doing. And I've already alluded to this, but there is a great passion in our society for information with little regard for transformation, right? There, there seems to be an undue, unhealthy zeal and passion to acquire knowledge, to acquire information, and there's not a whole lot of follow-through sometimes, so in the end, we have belief down, but we haven't changed at all. In fact, there seems to be a, a mountain of sermons and resources and information out there, but there's no accountability, no structure to apply to our lives to make sure that we actually do something about it. And so in the end, we become masters of information, but not necessarily masters of implementation. And look, we Christians, we can't argue this point. We as Christians aren't any better at marriage. We're not any better at when it comes to debt. We're not any better when it comes to consumerism. We're not any better when it comes to lust or pornography or any of those issues. Those are as big of an issue inside the walls of a church as they are outside the walls of the church. Now, why is this a big deal? Uh, Verse 13, look at the end of that again. There's a warning here that Jesus gives us. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So here's what the Bible says, not what Stephen says. This is what Scripture says right here. To believe, but to not practice, is worthless. To believe, but not to practice, is worthless. Just throw it out. It's good for nothing. And this is where, as a church, we have been headed for quite a while. So here's a reminder of where we've been historically. For the last thousand years, the church has kind of been a part of this shared cultural moral value of Christendom where basically all the institutions in our public sector have had this kind of underlying foundation of teaching Christian virtue. That's kind of like the default of a lot of folks is that, hey, we generally believe what the Bible says for the last thousand years. And let me just say this right now. Let's be clear. That reality is over. That, that day is gone. And the church has lost her place in culture. And the warning that Jesus gives us in the latter half of 13, and in many ways has come to fruition, no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Our collective salt has lost its saltiness because we believe, but we're not different. We know, but we're not doing. And we have nothing to point to as an example. Like We can't say, hey, world, do it like we're doing it. Like, like marriage works when you do it this way. Marriage works when, when, when the man loves the wife, like Christ loved the church, and, and when the woman respects the headship of the husband, and, and hey, don't, don't, don't get divorced. And at the same time, people in the church are getting divorced, and, and their marriages are falling apart. We often say, hey, don't look at pornography. Don't you deal with lust in your heart because it's going to ruin your sex life and you're going to really start to train your brain to, to see men and women as objects and, and all that. And yet, this is the kind of stuff that pastors get busted for all the time. 
and the world sees it, and we've kind of become the clowns of culture, right? I mean, when was the last time that in, in, in media we've been kind of portrayed in a great light? It doesn't happen. And we've earned it. Because we have belief but no transformation. We've mastered information and applied very little of it. So this is kind of the key also to our series title. I mean, Key Christianity Weird. And it's kind of sad that we actually have to throw this out as a title to remind us as Christians that we ought to look differently. So how did we get here? How did we get to this place in, in our church life? And with the time we have left, I think that by looking at how we got here, we might be able to redirect our efforts and reclaim our saltiness. And if we focus and figure out kind of what was the problem that led to our demise? What are some spiritual battles that are still worth fighting? So if you're note takers, four things. I just want to talk about four things with the time we have left. How we've lost our saltiness. I don't know if that grammar is correct, but we're going with it. Um, How we've lost our saltiness. Number one, I alluded to this already, but we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten who we are. Throughout Scripture, God has many names for himself, but God also calls us many things as well. So if you read your Bible, we, you know, I am a friend of God. I am a child of God. I'm a new creature. I'm a freed slave. I am more than a conqueror. And in verse 13, Jesus stops and tells us again who we are. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. That's who you are. You are salt. So, in fact, just turn to your neighbor right now and just say, you are salt. Say, you are salty. And try to lick your neighbor. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. That'd be weird. So, this, this is who we are. Listen, this is who we are right now. Not tomorrow. And, and Jesus doesn't say, hey, would you consider this? Would you maybe put this on your to-do list? No, no. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. All right, this may be a review for some of us. It was for me a little bit, but this is an indicative. Okay, so what does that mean? An indicative is something that's true about you. It's something that's true about you. An imperative is something that is a command. It's something that's asked of you. But an indicative is something that's true about you. Now, did you know that for every command given to the Christian in Scripture, it's based off of something that's true about you? All right, like if you boil every single command in Scripture down to like one phrase, it, it really is pretty simple. It's this. It's be who you are. Be who you are. For example, if the command in 1 Corinthians 6 is to flee sexual immorality, well, well why? Why do I do? Because your body is a temple. Because this is who you are. It's renewed and redeemed, and the Holy Spirit resides in you. So this is an indicative in Matthew 5, verse 13. It says, you are salt. That's who you are. You are salt. Next week, we get to the command to go be a light to the world. But for right now, we're salt. So do you know this truth about you, church? Do you, do you know this about yourself? I think many of us, in some ways, have lost our true north. And it takes verses like this for, for God to grab us and shake us a little bit and say, hey, this is your identity. This is who you are. And how can we ever think that we would be influential? How can we ever think that we'd be salty for the cause of Christ if we don't even know who we are, if we don't know what Christians look like? You see, I think the world has a way of looking at the church that I think the church is actually starting to believe. And it kind of pops up in weird ways. Like, I, I really think that there are Christians, mature Christians even, who in their gut have started to feel like evangelism's kind of weird. Like, sharing your faith is it's kind, of, it's kind of awkward. Uh, you know, we should actually keep, you know, private faith out of public conversations. Christians shouldn't push their religions on people. And I, I think there are, it's scary because this is something obviously the world believes about Christians, but I think this is something that we're starting to believe as well a little bit. When in fact, this is what a Christian does. A Christian shares their faith. Like maybe not all of us go to, to Lebanon or Thailand or Mexico and we don't have time. That's fine. You don't have to go to another place to share your faith. 
You don't have to go to another place to be salt. You don't have to go, you can be salt to your family. You can be salt to your wife. I mean, there's, there's not a, a specific way that we're supposed to do this. God has called all of us to share our faith. And so when things that are very baseline, foundational, great commission, was Jesus the Son of God, is the Bible true? When those kinds of things kind of come into question, we realize we've lost, we've lost something. Our identity is kind of messed up a little bit. And we must remember who we are. Number two, number two is this, we still have one foot in the past. We still have one foot in the past. Uh, Paul, someone who's very familiar with second chances, he encourages us to never look back. And one of the key ways that we get confused about our identity is to think about all the bad things we've done. And Paul says, look, take it from me. I am the king of, of doing bad things, right? I'm the king of sinners. I've killed Christians. I've terrorized children. <clears throat> and the only way you can move forward is to accept the grace of God. And this is Paul's example for us. And he says in Romans, having been set free from sin, you have been bound to righteousness, so there are some in this room who have been absolutely paralyzed by the guilt and the shame they feel about something that happened a long time ago. I just want to remind you that because of the blood of Jesus, we can let those things go. We can let it go. And uh, look, this is, a, this is a little different. Let me, let me make a distinction here. Matthew 5, verses 3 through 4, just look down at your Bibles and be reminded, we talked about being poor in spirit. We talked about being mournful of our sins. And Jesus is reminding us of our spiritual state. And this is a little bit different than what I'm talking about. We are obviously spiritually, overall, we're bankrupt of that. We're lost. We, can't, we don't bring anything to the table. We don't have any good in us to bring to the table by ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we have to allow the fact that, you know, you slept with your girlfriend three years ago or that you yelled at your kids last week, that doesn't dictate your spiritual journey from here on out. We're sinners. And we can let that sin go at the foot of the cross. And some of us have passed up amazing opportunities to be used by God because we're still hung up on sin. We're still hung up on something that happened a long time ago. And if we want to be clear about who we are, we're salt, right? Then we can't get caught up on who we once were. That's number two. Number three. Number three, how we've lost our solitudeness. We've abandoned real community. We've abandoned real community. I think there's been there's an absolute breakdown of kind of real community, uh, genuine community in, in our world. And this has been uh, written about quite a bit. Chris references this book often, uh, Bowling Alone. And it's a, it's a study and social commentary on how we as Americans have become increasingly less like disconnected from one another, and how our involvement in, you know, organizations like whether it be the PTA or church or the Rotary Club or, you know, political affiliations, things like that, they're just not as important to us as Americans anymore, and they play less and less of a role. So just a few stats from this book I want to share with you guys. Uh, this is from, uh, from Putnam's Bowling Alone, and it talks about the amount of time uh, people spend in organizational life has declined. Um, over the last 40, 50 years, so close to four hours in the 60s, three hours in 1975, and then down to 2.3 hours in the 80s and 90s. Uh, on an average day, percentage spent in a community organization, so 1965, it was 7%, down to 3% in 1995. And then even the way that we spend our money and how we kind of, you know, we, we kind of vote with our dollar when it comes to how we're going to spend time with people, uh, we spent six cents on the dollar in 1929 down to three cents in the dollar in 1997. And so all these stats, what they mean is that collectively, America has become less, has put less and less of an emphasis on community, on being together. And unfortunately, this, is, this isn't any less true in the church. I mean, it takes some really outgoing and organized folks to get some church together, you know, sometimes. And it takes a, a lot of leadership and good structure for things like growth groups to feel like a priority. And I, I've been a Christian all my life, and uh, close to all my life, and one of, the, one of the main constants that I go back to in my 33 years is that I need two things. Or I, I need two things. I need constant encouragement and rebuking. And this is what 
godly friendships. This is what a church, a healthy church is for. This is what a growth group is for. And so if you don't have those things, you need them. Because the truth is, is we can't do it on our own. And I know you hear that at church a lot, but let me just be real for a minute because I really don't think that I have the full view. I, I, I know I don't. Because uh, here's what happens. Uh, every couple years as I get older, I look back at me about three years ago, and I'm like, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> and I don't know if maybe you've had that experience, but you kind of think you're doing all right, and you kind of get, get older and wiser, and, and it keeps happening. You kind of look back, and you're like, that guy really wasn't that, that smart. And I'm hoping by like the age of 50, and I finally look back at 47, I'm like, that guy was brilliant. That guy was awesome. But it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. And as I get older, I keep looking back. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Now, let me be honest with you. Right now, I'm feeling all right, okay? I'm, I'm feeling okay. I feel like I'm submitted to the Lord. I feel like I'm loving my wife the way Christ has called me to. I feel like I'm engaged in the life of my kids. I, I'm pretty sure I'm doing all I could be doing, but I know for a fact that whether it's a year or two or three or maybe next week, I'm going to look back at me and be like, that guy needs a lot of work. And it's just true, right? Like, and if that's true, how much do we need people at any given time to speak into our life, to tell us, hey, your marriage, it's just not healthy right now? Oh, man, I don't want someone telling me that. Well, maybe you need that. Oh, hey, man, I, I, the way you just talk to your kids right now, just, hey, just, just let, me, let me share this with you. And we need people in our lives to encourage us when we're down, absolutely, but we also need people to kind of, hey, let's have a, let's have a chat for a minute because I feel like there could be something that you're missing here. Let me just add something real quick to this, uh, especially for those of you who are maybe the, kind of an older generation. I'm not going to throw an age out there. You can self-identify. That's fine. But it, if you kind of consider yourself part of the older generation, and I, I realize as I get older, I'm not that old. I'm a, kind of like a, at the end of the millennial generation, early Gen X, and I don't know exactly where the cutoff is, but um, you know, I think as I get older, as we do, we start to become a little bit wiser, and we start to think that we know more. And I, I've seen this quite often as folks get older, is they think that they don't need this kind of community. And I, I want to just challenge those of you who are, who are older, and again, take that however you, however you want to, but if, if you have been around the block, and yet you do not have this kind of accountability in your life, there are younger people who are looking up to you, and you have a responsibility to really make sure that you have this authentic community part down, that you have people in your life that are speaking into your life, that you've allowed people, that you're not so concerned about, well, hey, I've been here for 25 years, blah, 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 or I've had this job title. Like, we don't, no one cares when it comes, when, at the end of the day, like, are, are you spiritually, are you growing? And as, as somebody from a younger generation, it's just, it's such a blessing to me when I interact with older folks who just, who still are humble enough to allow people in. And so we all need that. We all need people we all need godly men and women in our lives who are running the same race that we are. All right, finally, last one. How we've lost our salt in this. Number four, we're in too much of a hurry. We're in too much of a hurry. Scripture speaks a lot to how we must slow down and live patiently. James 5, 7 through 8 says this, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And I love that last, that last line, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It, it, you know, James gives us this perspective. It's like, hey, look, at the end of the day, Jesus is coming soon. And so you need to be ready, but you need to be patient as you wait. And I think that you and I, we live in a culture that is really built on speed. And sometimes we're just, we're surprised even when things take longer than they should. And we shouldn't be surprised. But we're just so impatient. Like, like I love how sometimes we're on the 210 freeway at like 515 and there's traffic. And you're like, what are, what's happening? Like, what, what are these cars here for? Like, what's, is something happening right now? Like, like no, like this is, this is the world you live in, right? Like four to seven every day, this is reality. You're in traffic. Or one of my favorites is how everybody gets frustrated on a Friday night when they go out to dinner 
And, uh, and, and there, you go out to dinner at 7 p.m., and it's like a 45-minute wait, right? And so you're driving around the parking lot, and you've got your family with you, and you're like looking around, and you send a runner out, right? Because you've got to find out what, you know, how much time is in there. And so, so you send out your, your least favorite kid, because if you, you lose them, <laughs> you can just move on. It's not a big deal. But... So you send a runner out, but, you're dry, but you know the answer, because there, there's like people sitting out on the grass, there's a guy who has a tent out there, and someone's <laughs> built a fire, and so, so your, your, your kid comes back, and he's like, ah, oh, 45 minutes, but our entire party has to be there, we can't just, can't just put my name in, and so we're like, ah, oh, all right, let's just try to find someplace else, and of course you can't find someplace else on a Friday night. But we're just so frustrated when things don't happen fast. And so we upgrade our cell phones after eight months, and we, we need a new computer immediately. And there's just all this stuff that we're not patient about. And believe it or not, you probably know where I'm going with this, the Christian life is not built on speed. Our spiritual growth doesn't happen overnight. Our spiritual growth is a crawl. It's, it's for the patient. It's for those who are long-suffering. It's for those who have endurance. Paul talks about it being a race, a marathon. And when it comes to spiritual maturity, when it comes to being, having opportunities to influence and be salt, spiritual growth is one step at a time, putting one foot in front of the other. So that, let that be a rebuke, but also an encouragement for you. If you're in a rush, just relax, right? If if you're going slow, be encouraged. This is, everyone is going slow. Everyone's going slow when it comes to our, our Christian life. Paul says in Romans 5, 3, he says, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. It speaks to this idea, this kind of old-timey, old-fashioned word, steadfastness, right? To be steadfast. It's like your kids. You can, you can stare at your kids all day. You're not gonna see them grow. You can just like, camp out and just hang out and watch them, but they're, just, they're not going to grow if you stare at them, right? Until one morning you're making breakfast and your son or daughter comes in, you hug them, and you're like, you grew three inches like overnight. And of course they didn't. It's just, that's not how growth works. You can't, you can't watch it happen. It just slowly does as you measure it. And so as we continue to pursue growth, remember that it's a crawl. So we see this as a church, day by day, year by year, our, our church, the church is losing its position in society. And it's happening because we have lost our saltiness, because so few of us are applying what we say we believe. And in this chase, these big questions, who are we, what are we supposed to be doing, we've come up with a lot of information, and we don't have a lot to show for it. My college pastor, I remember he used, to, he used to call this the longest 12 inches in the world. And it's the distance between here and here. Right? Like, if, because we can, we can know it here, and if it doesn't transform us in our hearts, if it doesn't transform us with what we do in our lives, then it really, it's really difficult to get things done. And so, where does this leave us? Where does this leave us? I think we have some questions to ask ourselves. I think, uh, my prayer is that we would begin to ask God for help in some of these areas. Seek the Lord earnestly and ask, like, why, why isn't my life influential? Why isn't my life salty? Where am I being disobedient right now? This is a scary question because usually for some of us, there's, there's some hidden sins that we like to hang on to and God will bring those sins from the darkness into the light. Where do I need to be obedient? Where does God want me to be right now? Where is he calling me to? Where am I supposed to be stepping out in faith? And so after reading Matthew 5, verse 13, do you know your calling on this earth? Have you surrounded yourself with community and accountability? Have you let go of past sin? And is your spiritual posture one of patience and steadfastness? That's a lot to think about. That's a lot of work. But as we talked about at the beginning, it's God who does the work. And my hope is that God would reveal in my heart and in your heart how we can, we can be obedient to him, how we can start living this life the way we're supposed to. So what are we supposed to be doing? What's our calling? Who are we? We're salt. Right now, right here, this isn't our five-year plan. This is a present indicative. We are salt. And so now that we know, and now that we're clear, 
we can get to work and we can start to influence the world around us. We can be obedient to Christ, not only by what we know up here, but what we do with our hands, what we do with our feet, how we influence the communities that we live in. So that's salt. Next week we'll talk about light and what that empowers us to do. But uh, let's bow our heads. Let's ask the Lord to help us to this end. Father, it's good to be with friends, and I thank you for these men and women who sit here, and I thank you just for the opportunity to open up your word. And God, I thank you that your word refines us, and it changes us, and it convicts us, Lord. And I pray that 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 would happen in our hearts, and my hope is that you would reveal the areas where we've been disobedient. You would reveal the areas where we've kind of just assumed that knowing is enough, that just accumulating knowledge is enough and convict us when we don't do anything about it. God, so many of the people in this church, we have opportunities every day to be salt and light. And God, I I pray that we would start acting on some of those opportunities. And so we pray for your help. We pray that you would help us wrestle with these things and that you would clearly give us steps for obedience And I just continue to pray, Lord, for our church. God, I thank you for Glendora. I thank you for this community that you put us in. I thank you for Fuddle Church and how you have called us specifically in this time and place to be salt and light to this community. And so I pray that we'd be good stewards of that and that it would start with us, that we wouldn't pass the buck and say, hey, what what ministry is the church going to put together next or what mission trip is going to happen next year? God, but we would we would resolve in our own hearts that I'm going to be salt today. On the way out of here, as I talk to people, when, I, when I'm at lunch with friends, and Lord, that we would be changed because of your word. God, we thank you. We ask for your help. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, um, look, if, if you don't know Jesus this morning, none of this really matters. It starts with Christ. It starts with Jesus. And so really quickly, Here's what the gospel is. Jesus loves us so much that he sent his son to die in our place because we were sinners, because we were lost, we were rebellious against him. And some of you who are far from Christ know that feeling. You know a feeling of being far from God. And so instead of asking us to do better and and work harder, he gave us his son to die on a cross for us for our sins so we can be reconciled to the Father. And so that's the beauty of the gospel. All we have to do is simply say yes to Jesus and say, Lord, please take over my life. I'm I'm messing this up on my own. And so if you don't know Jesus this morning, we would love to support you in that decision. We'd love to walk alongside you as you get to know him. Uh, We are a church, I think I said it earlier, we're a church of broken people. We're a church of, of people who don't have our stuff together, but we're doing this together. And we'd love to be able to support you as you become a Christian, perhaps for the first time today. So there's this card that I had. It's right here. And uh, on the front it says, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And you can simply just check that box. And um, obviously we say this every week, checking a box doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, it simply lets us know that we can be praying for you, we can support you um, in your new journey of faith. We're going to end with a time of worship, a time of communion. So for those of us who are part of the family of God, uh, this is for for us uh, to to partake in uh, in the body and the blood and to to remember what Christ did for us. So let's do this in remembrance of him. Let's worship because he's good. And uh, let's do this together.
last breath you spoke Before the trees and skies They sing their songs above you spoke Revealing peace Long ago the sins of men were paid with blood
church. Please come. Make it your prayer. Please come and heal, restore, reveal. Come speak to me. Sing it again, church. Sing it, please. Please come. Have a great week, guys.